Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining. Today I'm speaking with Clyde Rathbone. Clyde is has started a new social media company called Letter, and he also used to play rugby for Australia. Hi Clyde, thanks for coming on. Abide, thank you for having me. Yeah, so, okay, I gotta ask, like, how did you go from rugby to a social media company that's based around writing letters? Like, it just that just seems a very weird transition to me. <laughs> yeah, it's weird to me as well. Um, so I, I finished playing in 2014. And at the time, I was going to go and take up a, or at least explore a bursary option with Cambridge. Um, so someone reached out to me. Um, he was an old boy at Cambridge. And at the time, I was writing a weekly column for the Sydney Morning Herald, which is the biggest newspaper in Australia um, in the last couple of years of my career. And that, that was what opened the door to the Cambridge opportunity. And I was exploring that. And in the midst of that, my brother and I, um, he was living with me at the time. He's got a background in computer science and games programming. We were living together and we we're just talking about the internet one night over dinner. And we we're just you know, wondering out loud why it was that the kinds of conversations that we have in the real world you know, around dinner tables or with friends and family tend to be so much more interesting and engaging than the kinds of dialogue that we would have on the internet, so on the Twitters and Facebooks of this world. And, and then that conversation went on for a couple of hours and we were just kind of thinking about what what are the key factors that underpin quality conversation and why it's so rare to have these really meaningful, thoughtful, longer form engagements on the internet and, and what, it, what would a platform look like if it was trying to mimic um, the real world norms that tend to underpin productive conversation? I, okay, the, the whole idea of letter I really like. Now, I have to be honest. I've just been kind of like a lurker and I've been reading some of the stuff and I haven't <laughs> actually used it, but okay, I enjoy that. It, it's, you know, it's, you're act, you're, you are reading a conversation, um, mm -hmm. but I mean, it goes back to uh, like sort of in the Victorian area where they, you know, there were stories and novels that were put together of letters, right? Of like people kind of writing letters to between fictional folks. And so it's kind of like that. Yeah. Maybe it's a little bit voyeuristic. I don't know. But yeah, that's something that's really lacking. Like I was speaking with, um, uh, and again, someone I met on Twitter, uh, Patrick Lockwood, and we were talking about this. And it's, you know, you need to slow down. Like it's just an instant response on Twitter, or uh, like you're talking about sitting around having a conversation. So you're know, you're sitting in a pub with your friends, and mm -hmm. oh, do you remember this movie? And do you remember who said that? And then you could have a conversation for an hour about who said mm -hmm. what and what. But now it's just like, I'll just go to Google and find the answer. And it just kind of like kills everything. But. Yeah. And I, and I think there's, there's, I mean, there's tremendous benefits to having this access to information. But I think what, what the internet has done is ushered in a bunch of unintended consequences. No one really could predict the kinds of echo chambers and the political polarization and the ideological tribalism that I think would emerge Online, you know, it was always assumed that having better access to data and, and the truth and being more connected by these digital means would lead to a kind of convergence in our values or at least push us in that direction. And in many ways, the opposite has occurred and that it's now very easy to find people that are like minded, regardless of how wrong headed an idea might be. And <laughs> You know, you can find support for anything. It's something like the flat Earth society springs to mind. Um, yeah, and I think, and I think this, this this ability to connect with people from anywhere on the globe is is just such an amazing technology. It's just it's it isn't being used in a particularly intelligent way, and it's there's a certain irony in what we're doing, which is really going back to. Uh, a, 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 an old-fashioned technology. You know, letter writing has been around for hundreds of years and it has tremendous power in the sense that when you are corresponding in that format, you, 
you're in a different mindset. It's almost like you enter a different mode. You you kind of touched on it there, and then you slow down, and you take your time, and you are more thorough, and you can be more curious, and you don't feel this pressure to be performative in a sense in the same way you might feel on the other platforms and i think part of that is is down to the way we've designed the platform and part of it is just inherent in the process of writing a letter with another person and you know whilst on twitter and facebook and so on you know there's likes and there's comments and it's very it's a very communal experience on on letter you know that your correspondence is public and that anyone can view it, but it is very much a experience you're having with your collaborator. And that I think that changes things quite subtly as a user, but then in the end product that it produces, I think it's quite significant. Yeah, I mean, again, the, the, you brought up something there, like the, the amount of information we have. And I've heard some people complain about that, well, there's too much information. And, okay, there's a lot of it, but I think the, the bigger problem, you know, we're not, we're not training people how to do research. Like, like, okay, I'm a product of when I went to school, I learned how to do research in the library, I learned how to use the, the card catalog, and I learned how to, you know, find stuff out. And then if you go to the fiction section, you know you're getting fiction. If you go to, you know, a reference section, you're getting reference material. It has been parsed in some way. You go on Google and you're at the mercy of the algorithm. You're at the mercy of, mm. you know, what the algorithm thinks you want, not what you need. And yeah. so like, I've heard that. I've heard this, like, you know, there's too much information. I, it's, I don't think there is. I, I think it's. Yeah, it's, I think it's a signal to noise problem. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the data is what we want. We just want to be better at accessing or at least passing the quality from the nonsense and that's that's the real challenge and you've hit the nail on the head with the reference to the algorithms i mean they're designed with an advertising model in mind not with uh, not with optimizing for truth it's they're not designed to at least they're not necessarily designed to lead us to what's true in many cases they're optimizing for our screen time so they just really want to keep us around as long as possible and that leads to some interesting outcomes so one is it, just, it the algorithms just keep feeding us content that they know is going to be highly emotive um, stuff that causes outrage um, because that gets us to stick around and that's a real problem because i think it deepens the divide that exists in, in you know, online and that spills over into the real world and you get people that are almost narrow casting their various channels to the point where they're never really being exposed to a well argued different view. It's it's just this cherry picked consistent reinforcing of existing worldviews and, and this is a significant problem. You know, we're we're seeing this play out in election results. We're seeing it play out in all kinds of ways that are, I guess, unexpected. You know, like if you look at what's happening at universities right now, um, it, it really boils down, I think, to dogmatism. It's what we want is not everyone to agree on everything. What we want is a process of engagement that is more productive. And I think to do that, you need to purpose build platforms for that, for that outcome. Yeah. Okay. I mean... I'll just give you a little bit of my background because uh, we don't really know each other that well. So I left North America in 2002 and I got a contract and I, I worked as a contractor, a civilian contractor to set up communication systems for the military. Originally the Canadian military and that was in Bosnia. Then I went to Afghanistan and I was doing it again for the Canadian military. Then it was for NATO in Afghanistan. Then it was just for different contractors everywhere. And I did that until yeah. the end of 2013. I came back to Canada February or March of 2014. Um, I just, I've bummed around Southern Europe to relax for a bit, but I didn't use social media. Like I was gone before social media was really a thing, you know, unless you want to, I don't even know if Napster or a Friendster or something was around back then. Yeah. 
<laughs> and on military bases, they don't allow you to use social media because, well, you have very limited access to it because of security mm-hmm. reasons, right? So I came back and I'm looking around. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Like, <laughs> the world was sane when I left. And I yeah. come back and it's, you know, like, I, I see blasphemy laws, you know, or, or, yeah. or in all but name, they're blasphemy laws. And, mm-hmm. You know, the thing that gets me the most, and it's like I've been kind of changing my the way I discuss it and the the free speech um, argument mm-hmm. where it's not just, OK, the speakers are losing their right to speak and it's a horrible thing. And I, you know, I'll, I'll defend anyone's right to speak, but we ourselves are losing the right to choose what we get to listen to. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, like if. Uh, baby, it's cold outside. Is going to get boycotted from radio stations. I mean, you know, I, I don't know, really know the song, and I have no love for it. I hadn't heard about it until that whole thing's happened. But it, it's kind of mm-hmm. ridiculous. I mean, it's yeah, yeah. It is. It's fascinating. You know, as a outside observer of what's happened in the last ten years online. You know, I grew up in South Africa, where you know the internet speeds didn't really allow for. Any of any of the kind of access, and I remember moving to Australia. But the the way I learned about this place was from talking to people who had been here, or from going to the library and reading books about Australia. And now, before you travel somewhere, you can you can go there on the internet, and you can. And this is I think this is awesome. But it's there. I think the downsides of that are that we just we're not required to be as thoughtful and as curious um it's you kind of mentioned it before everything is so on tap now um and then i think the the other thing that's really interesting is just how people engage with one another you know that whenever you see a really aggressive combative bad faith argument online you can almost be sure that those two Correspondents wouldn't behave that way across the table from one another, and I think what some of the problem there lies at anonymity. You know, the fact that you can you can be a different person or hide behind a pseudonym online uh, is a real is a real problem. And there's definitely plenty of of cases, and, and you know, particularly some hard edge cases where anonymity is absolutely critical. But for the most part, I think it's it does more harm than good. Um, and then you you throw together platforms like like Twitter, which is, is is kind of like a digital public square where anyone can say anything to anyone else, and you arm them with anonymity, and all of a sudden it just turns into a, just you know a house yeah. fire. Yeah. Okay. Like that. Um, there's a song by uh, Roger Waters, and I know he's like a little bit of a contentious person right now, but. Uh, it came out in the early 90s and it was called The Bravery of Being Out of Range. And that's exactly what it is. Like being anonymous on Twitter, or even not really being anonymous. Like I could say something to, you know, Muhammad bin, bin Salman. Mm-hmm. And yes, granted, you know, you can say the whole Khashoggi thing, but I have, you know, I'm pretty secure sitting in Montreal and sending him a tweet, right? Mm-hmm. You have that, bravery so i mean yes and adding anonymity to it it's a whole other layer and i get that um you know i know a lot of people who are you know like ex-muslims and things like that and Mm -hmm. for them that's important but yeah absolutely to abuse it you know if you require it you need it it's great but if you use that then just to attack people then you don't deserve that protection well i think it's 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 almost as though the internet lacks a theory of mind. You know, when you're staring at another person's face, you don't have to be reminded that you're dealing with another human being. But when it's through the screen and they're, they've got some avatar as their profile picture and their name is clearly some sort of pseudonym, it disconnects us from that reality that, that this is a person. and. It just it changes the nature of our engagements, and some people can navigate that space and, and act ethically all the time. But it's that seems to be quite rare to me. Most people 
they they stumble in that environment and they they become tribal they become combative and it's it's part of the reason why when we designed letter we wanted to spend some time looking at the various online platforms why is it that youtube has a particular culture and twitter has a culture and facebook and linkedin and they all differ in certain ways and what are the things that underpin those cultures and how can we how can we harness the best bits and and, and not repeat the same mistakes and and i think we've done a relatively good job of that so far yeah okay like i said i've been lurking and looking at some of these conversations and so there's one that i was looking at and it was one like i i don't want to say names or anything and i, I know it's all open but still it's uh, one was a person who describes themselves in, as an SJW, and mm-hmm. the other one would be, I guess, you know, classically liberal. Um, you know, how you, some, something along those lines, like Enlightenment values. And you know, again, there, there's these two people with completely different, you know, lenses on how they view the world. Yeah, and they might say they want similar sounding things, but when they explain it, they're completely different. But it's if that was a if any of those letters were an exchange on Twitter. I mean, first of all, they'd be insanely long threads, but there'd be a yeah. lot of vitriol and a lot of viciousness in there. Yeah, and, exactly. you know, like just sitting there, like you said, like you, you had mentioned earlier, you sit there, you sit down, you have to think about it, you're writing it out. And, you know, when you're doing it that way and you're writing out something long form, the better angels of your nature might actually kick in. Yeah. Yeah. You get to actually explore what it is you actually think, you know, on Twitter, everything's so reactive. Yeah, you know, I just should probably pull up stumps there and say that I think Twitter's awesome for connecting people and then trying to understand what people care about. It's just not very well suited to thoughtful conversation. Um, so, you know, like when you're having a letter exchange with someone, you have to actually explore what you think before or during the writing process. And you, you don't often get that opportunity in you know 104 what was it 280 characters it's especially if your first impulse is to disagree with someone rather than actually absorb what it is they've positioned and a letter exchange i think just lends itself more to that curious exploration of a different point of view and it it, it the power of that i think is is vastly underestimated you know, even if it doesn't change your mind it can it can just erode some of your confidence in your positions and or it could strengthen them because you've actually stress tested them with another person. And we don't do, I don't think we do enough of this. And a little bit of skepticism of our own views is much needed. Um, or strengthening the ones that we, that we're, we're most confident about. I think that's, these, these are things that can't be done in short form, rapid fire, sort of ephemeral platforms. I think we, we need to go deeper and that's that's why we put the letter is to allow that interaction to take place. Yeah, but I mean like, you know, that's just going back to like having a dialectic, right? And you know, exactly. also I mean it's you know, it's straight out of Milton and Mill. Like you know, you, <laughs> you you need to have that no, but I mean like you need to have that opposing argument. I, I was actually I've been kind of playing around with this idea and I've spoken to a couple of people and it's like okay let's take Areopagitica let's take a look at that book because it came out right you know under the shadow of the advent of the uh, the printing press right so now do you need an Areopagitica 2.0 because of all this talk of okay can we do we have to ban this on the internet what you know can we block out hate speech can we do this like like my argument is still no let's you know get people to think better and maybe we need to learn how to parse the information better and how to you know protect ourselves from the algorithm because we need to do that we we you know we can't let ourselves be at the mercy of it um i don't know like it's like i said like i still don't know understand why we're ha- we keep having this argument over and over and over again like do we need to ban speech do we need to ban expression like do we need to limit what people can see and read like it just... mm. yeah i mean it, it's it is kind of baffling in, in the sense that it's, it's the only speech is the only means by which we can update our ideas. And if we can't communicate, we can't even get started on that process and shutting things down. It, it really is papering over the cracks and it's just going to hide the problem until it reemerges in a different form. And it's, it's so interesting that 
this is a this is emerged now. You know, I, I even though my company is in this space, I still am, am shocked by this phenomenon. You know, I grew up in South Africa uh, at the heights of the apartheid era, so I was born in the 1980s. Nelson Mandela was released from prison in the early 90s and South Africa had its first democratic elections in 1994 so there were there were that experience of going to primary school and having the first black kid allowed at school and then transitioning into a peaceful democracy was I think very informative of what uh, we're doing now with letter in the sense that it really drove home the the fact that the world can be a kind of dystopia that you, you can live in a, in, a, in a 1984 Orwellian reality. And I think we've, particularly in the West, we, we may have lost touch with that. And I think that's led to some of what, to, to my mind, seem like really frivolous concerns, you know, pronouns becoming <laughs> central political uh, focuses. You know, there's... Uh, I, and, uh, yeah. So, and again, I guess that's where what we want on letter is really substantive debates about meaningful ideas. But I think we're also not closed off to, you know, this is a question someone raised with me yesterday. And he said, like, ideally, you've got two people acting in good faith, exploring an idea from opposing positions. But it, there's also tremendous value in having a bad faith actor engaging with a good faith actor in the sense that you can start to see, it kind of exposes the style of debate um, when someone's acting in, in bad faith. You can It becomes a really useful resource for the reader to follow along and say, well, this person's clearly not adhering to productive rules of engagement. So yeah, you know, we'd like to see a whole range of different, I'm totally open to any conversation um, appearing on leather. Yeah, okay, speaking yeah. of that though, because... Uh, not the bad faith thing, because I, I hope, I, I hope, and I don't think it will. Seeing from who's who's uh, showed some interest in this, but you've got a competition going right now where you're looking for, you know, let's just say argument, not you know, mm -hmm. not bad faith, but like good faith argumentation and debate. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the competition is in itself an experiment. You know, can we? bring people from vastly different parts of the political ideological spectrum together to have a good faith conversation around really contentious, contentious issues. And I think we can, and I think we, we have to do this. It's, it's the time. I think there's been a shift in the online space and, and in, in the sense that people are really hungry for more meaningful, more thoughtful engagement on the, on the internet. And the competition is a way for us to, to try and encourage more of these kinds of good faith, difficult conversations, um, and particularly, you know, inviting people to have them on a platform that's really made for that sort of dialogue. Yeah, I mean, okay, I hope it works. And there, are, there are a couple of things that I, that I'm actually mulling over that I think I'm going to um, write and put in, uh, see what goes. But yeah, I mean, awesome. like, I, I hope they, like, I hope it gets going because, frankly, okay, Twitter, no, it just you know, I use Twitter to make smart alecky comments, and then you know when my podcast, when I release my podcast, I like, here you go, here's this, and that's that's about it. Facebook a little bit, you can write a little bit more long form, but again, that like you said, it's your your you know how many people like it, and then you're gonna have a fight in the comments about it, and then it's you know, it's it just sometimes not worth it. Like something like this, it just to me it seems a lot better. I mean, I. Again, this was something I'd said to someone, and I was, I was thinking more about on the lines of Google, uh, but you know, you can put this over to the other social media companies too, like especially something like YouTube. They have to make a decision whether they're landlords or they're librarians, mm -hmm. and yeah. you know, if your landlord's fine and you can evict someone, whatever, but give us a lease that's crystal clear and mm -hmm. apply it evenly across the board. Yeah, yeah, I think that's crucial. You know, I, it's it's a difficult space to be in because we're kind of defining the new rules as we go. You know, we know what has and hasn't worked to this point, but we're breaking new ground in the sense that these 
longer form platforms between people that have different views haven't really existed in the sense that you know on, on Facebook you can even you might even have a really productive engagement and they do happen but there's no permanency to it you know if I have a really interesting Twitter conversation with someone and trying to find that conversation six months or six years from now I mean it's just gets lost in a torrent of new data and one of the things we've tried to focus on with letter is making sure that the value of these con these conversations is persistent and deep into the future so that if you want to go back and see what you know someone had to say about topic X in you know, six, six years from now that's going to be a simple process you can just Google, or rather search for their their profile and find the conversations they've had. And I think that's that's really important that the content is organized in a way that it's easily accessible. Actually, it's uh, funny you mentioned that because I was going to ask you, like once this competition was over, were you going to have, I guess, you know, were people going to be able to go back and go through all the letters in the competition and all the conversations that had happened in that? Because, you know, mm. or even like, let's say at the end of a year, your first year, these were... So this was every conversation on um, evolutionary yeah, biology or something like that, right? Like, you... yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're still developing the platform to make navigating via topic uh, simpler. So right now, you can find an individual and you can see the conversations that they've had, and the every letter has a heading. It includes the topics that the letter, or rather, every conversation has. A heading that includes the topics that that conversation is covering, but it's still not a simple process to navigate. Say from as you mentioned, evolutionary biology to you know whatever whatever the the topic of interest is. So that's something that we're building. It's on our product development backlog. Okay, um, yeah, because that was another thing. I and it just like like I said, I'm I work so I work in IT, but I work on the hardware and things. I don't work on the you know the web development or anything like that. But mm -hmm. it's just getting back to this like slowing down thing which uh, so let's say you go into Google and you search for something now I think it w Google would be a lot better if they just made one simple change you open up Google and you have a bunch of tabs and it's you know history geography like science and if you go into science it'll break you know, break all that down so if you search for something you're mm -hmm. getting okay so you want to search for historical fiction so you put in civil war and then you know you have all those tabs then oh, you have the tab that says fiction so you know what you're getting but like right now you don't um yeah like are you yeah are you trying to like look at a way to parse stuff like that yes yeah, so one one way that we can at least get closer to this end goal of making the best content easy to find and the subjects easy to navigate is by sorting the conversations at least to some extent, by the number of subscribers they have. So if you and I start a conversation on the platform, any of the readers that are signed up to Letter can subscribe to that conversation to be notified when a new letter appears in that conversation. And I think conversations that have lots of subscribers, it's a strong indication that people are genuinely interested in this particular subject. It's a much stronger... Um, it's a much stronger data point, I think, than a like, uh, because a like is something that doesn't really cost you anything, whereas a subscription to the conversation means that you want to be told when there's new content. So one of the things we're doing now, if you go onto Letter and you go to the featured letters page, you'll notice that there's a series of conversations covering fairly diverse subject matters, but we have to, in a very manual way, at least at this point, sorted them by the interest from the readers. So people are telling us that they care about this subject by subscribing to this conversation. And we want to make sure that more people are aware of that. So there's we're learning as we go there. And, and it's gonna be it's gonna be very interesting going forward to work out the, the optimal ways to to help people navigate the site. Um, and I'm I'm actually comfortable moving relatively slowly there and, and making good decisions rather than just you know, it's so easy to just implement the existing protocols, but you know we know that they don't produce optimal results. So we're we're, pre we're prepared to take our time there if we have to. No, I mean that's good. Uh, like like I again, just from personal experience, I've seen people rush into 
yeah, let's roll this out now and let's get it going. And it's just, it's always a disaster. So yeah, no, take your time. Cause like, frankly, I, what I'm seeing so far, I really like, and you know, I, again, it's just from a voyeuristic point of view, but it's interesting and it's fun to read, but yeah, no, I, uh, I agree with you. Take your time in doing that. Um, okay. I, I'm going to ask you just, it's just cause it's cause the, the climate right now. Um, Again, when I came back in 2014, I was just like, I, I couldn't believe what was going on. So, did you notice when you left from, um, like, I'll ask you the question, I'll just give you, like, my take on it quickly. Like, when you left South Africa and you came to Australia, like, so, you know, South Africa, like you mentioned, like, you know, apartheid had ended, you are having democratic elections going in, and things were opening up. Now, did did you notice like a difference in the way race was looked at between the two countries? And okay, growing up in Canada, there was I had racism. I, I you know I faced it. It wasn't a big thing, and it wasn't like you know I'm not trying to make it out like it was horrible. But at the age of 14, I was taking public transit, and on the seat back in front of me was written "white power black caca," and the only word they spelled correctly was caca. And it's, ever since <laughs> see, yeah, no, but ever since seeing that, I'm like, you know what? Someone who's got that mentality, I'm better than them. So yeah, it, it's never really bothered me since then. But but like I said, Canada, there's not a lot of that overt. There is like a little subtle undertone to it. But I was just wondering if you notice a difference in like Australia and South Africa, and then what your uh, take is on the last five or six years. Like in my mind, everything's gotten way worse when people say they want to make it better. Yeah, it's super interesting question because I remember coming to. Australia. So I've been here now, I think it's coming up to 17 years. And when I arrived, it was interesting that a lot of people said to me, you know, Australia is a, is a racist country. And I remember thinking, it doesn't appear that way to me at all. It's, it's one of the most um, multicultural places on the planet Earth. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you go to Sydney and you can I mean, you'll just see all kinds of ethnicities and races, and it's just a massive melting pot. And, I, and my first reaction was, at least internally, was you know I came from a genuinely racist country where, you know, we, but to, to kind of, it was really shocking to me that people were so willing to throw that label around that you know Australia is a racist country because of how they they treated the First Nations people and. It's there's obviously massive atrocities that occurred there, but we need to get our our proportions right. You know, we we've so trigger happy with these terms, and it's become so political that it's it's hard to have a really honest conversation about these things. You know, Australia to me is is vastly different from South Africa in how they approach race. You know, I think that the, it's a small problem um, that is just not systemic uh, in the way that you might be led to believe if you follow the traditional media um so yeah i noticed a huge difference you know, in, in just attitudes to it's not, it's not to say there's no racism here clearly there is it's just it's it's a it's a giant leap to say that it's a racist country and um south africa is obviously still in the process of transformation you know from a just uh, incredibly oppressive regime to a functioning democracy and there's huge problems there that are just not shared by places like australia you've got social social political issues you've got incredible crime and violence um, problems you've got disease you've got massive corruption uh, at a political level and in amongst that you've got a you know burgeoning middle class um, so there's yeah, there's a whole bunch of issues there, and I, I'm not sure what to think. And I, I'm clearly not an expert about South Africa, but it, I'm concerned about the future of that country. You know, I think a lot of people, at least the international community, have felt as though from '94 onwards, it was things were resolved and we could all move on, and South Africa was fine. But it's, I think it's very much a, a work in progress, and I'm worried about the, the next decade. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. When you mentioned that about South Africa, that was like the attitude of a lot of things. Oh, communism has fallen. We're all one big free world now. Um, okay. We've taken care of Saddam. Everything's okay. You know, uh, 
you know, the, the Russians left Afghanistan. Uh, the Mujahideen beat them back. Everything's fine now. It just, I mean, like, we don't seem to learn. It's just, <laughs> you know, okay, yes, a great big step has been taken. You know, let's let's not get that, you know, let's not take away anything from there, right? Mm, yeah. But there's so much left to be done afterwards. It's like, okay, Trump saying ISIS has been defeated. Like, mm. In what way? I mean, they're mm. reforming in Africa. They're... They are st- kind of starting to reform in, in the Middle East, and you know nothing was done to fight that ideology, and yeah. that I mean, again, I don't want to you know I, I I hope I'm not trying to put too much pressure on your uh, platform, but you know you've got that here, and I think there is pushback against it, like you know the the, the woke culture or you know um, mm-hmm. all that stuff like cancel this cancel that like you know you're not allowed to talk about this you're not allowed to talk about that you know yeah. you know secular blasphemy laws type of thing and yeah you know well i think it, we want to invite these people to the table to have a conversation you know if if your attitude towards conversation is such that you don't believe the conversation itself is valuable then let it probably isn't the platform for you, and I and I don't think, I don't think anyone with that mindset can actually advance anything meaningful. Um, you know, shutting things down is a self-defeating strategy. Um, so I guess what we're who we're appealing to is the sane elements across the ideological spectrum, wherever they might be, and whatever the ideas are is kind of irrelevant. What matters is the willingness to engage in good faith and and i think the the benefits to the readers you know obviously anyone can jump on email and have a conversation in good faith with anyone who's willing but there's tremendous benefits for people to be able to follow along and actually see the conversation unfold and and that's the thing that most excites us is that yes the conversations themselves are critical but as educational tools i think they're they're unique it's very difficult to find these kinds of engagements anywhere else online. Yeah, no, I mean, again, like it's the the ability to speak to someone else and to hear that other viewpoint and to have your views challenged because it it's so easy on Twitter. Well, I just muted them, or you know, like I'll, I'll see pe- uh, you know, people are proud of the fact that I was blocked by so and so. It's like, yeah, really? Like you're taking pride in that? You went out and did that? Like, good for you. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm like, okay, I'm a huge proponent of that. Like, I, I, that's that's been my only kind of real thing is, let's push the expression, let's get more ideas out there. Um, and I mean, it's it, like the I don't know if you ever read the book Kindly Inquisitors by Jonathan Rauch or Roach. I don't know. My um, my brother read it and gave me the Crypt Notes version of it. But uh, yeah, I, I haven't read it myself, but I've heard fantastic reviews on that. Yeah, I mean, but that's your take on it. Oh, okay, that's exactly what, um, you know, that that's exa- like between that and there's a book by David Deutsch called uh, The Beginning of Infinity. And mm-hmm. I mean, okay, so the like I said, the Rauch's book, you know, he's talking about the the far right, but then he, uh, you know, and then there was the Ayatollah with the fatwa against uh, uh, Rushdie. But I mean, he also mentioned the humanitarian threat to lib- like what he called liberal science, right? So that's, Oh, we can't talk about that because it's racist. We can't talk about that because it's sexist. We can't talk about that because it's whatever <laughs> X, right? And it's the same thing. Yeah. Like it, he wrote it in the early '90s, and it could apply to anything that's going on at any university. You know, that student at Yale yelling at the at Nicholas yeah. Christakis because yeah. uh, you know he didn't make a home for her at Yale. Instead, he was trying to you know make it a place for her to like learn, which I thought that's what Yale was. But, you know, yeah. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's you want a safe place in the sense that you're safe enough to receive every possible idea, but not safe in the sense that you're closed from being exposed to ideas that might be confrontational um, or confronting, rather. And I, and I think that's the problem with uh, the West in many ways. And I kind of touched on this a bit. You know, if you come from a part of the world where the problems are real and existential and you don't get caught up on these peripheral issues that when we really analyze them they're not they don't really move the needle in any 
in any significant way. But if you're left to your own devices and you have no real, and I, and I think, you know, my, oh, I could be wrong about, totally wrong about this, but I think a large part of this actually stems from our, you know, the way our genes are meant to express themselves. You know, we're meant to wake up in the morning and focus on where our next meal is coming from and focus and be very much in the moment and be occupied with our survival in a day-to-day -day way. And it gave us something to do and to pour our energy into. And now we we don't have that pressure to to do things that help us to survive, but we have the same impulse to express ourselves in, in, a, in a way. And I think that's that's led to some of these problems. You know, we, we have to, we, we're driven to, to act, but we don't know how to steer the ship. And, and I think that's, you know, I, I just look at what, what gets airtime and you and and it's so hard to connect with how's this front page news when there are actual problems in the world and yeah it's it's i think we i think we need to i think by engaging with people across the divide we will start to figure some of this out you know we'll start to shift at least to start to triage and prioritize the the issues and until until we can do that, I think it's it's the, the major harm that is occurring through these like postmodern ideologies is just a distraction. It, it's such a huge opportunity cost. All the time we spend devoted to some sort of gender issue or you know some sort of pronoun debate is time we're not spending on fundamentally important problems. Yeah. yeah okay. I. But I'm also worried right now um, about the backlash to it, and I, 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 you know, I don't like all this stuff. The you know, the, focusing on all that stuff. I mean, it's. Uh, I think it was Mark Stein, uh, and I mean, say what you will of him, but he said, you know, these are the conversations we're ha we're gonna have when we get nuked, right? <laughs> I think he said when the mullahs nuke us. Um, so I mean, it's like. But then you have the backlash to it, like, you know, Ben Shapiro just a couple of days ago, or I think it was today, freaking out because no one's seen Brett Kavanaugh's penis and no one can give a description of it. So how can it be sexual abuse? <laughs> I mean, like, no, but uh, come on. This guy's supposed to be a serious intellectual from the right or from the conservative movement. And like, yeah. honestly, and, and that that's what you've got? Or you, you know, like, you're telling me Ben Shapiro and Candace Owens and Charlie Kirk are the... The intellectual response to the woke culture, mm, yeah. You know, like, like I worry about that. I worry about the backlash. Are we going to go? You know, you're going to get an overcorrection, and you're going to go too far. Um, it, like, you know, yes, the pendulum's going to swing, but can we at least stop it so it sits in the center for a little bit before it goes to the crazy on the other side? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I should just wind back what I was saying to some extent, and then I think these issues must be debated, mm. but. The reason they need to be debated is so that we can put them on the proper place on the shelf and say, well, you know, th this is not unimportant, but how important is it relative to X, Y, Z? And, and you know, like you've touched on part of the problem being that the sort of this cult of personality that exists on both sides is it's driving these extremely sensationalistic um, narratives that aren't yeah, aren't really, they aren't about, they're not about reaching across the divide to say, hey, let's have a open conversation. They're about performing to your particular tribe. You know, Ben Shapiro is someone that I've you know, watched a few YouTube clips on, so I'm hardly an expert on him, but it does seem as though he's he's the right, uh, what's, the, what's the right word here? He's like their superstar. You know, he roll him out when you want to see the left get punched in the face. But is it actually is it actually bringing is it inviting people into a conversation, or is it just a sport? And if it's just a sport, well then let's just continue on as we are. But if we're actually trying to change minds, we need a different approach. Okay. Yes. These these topics are important, and talking about you know, okay, so let's say you know the, the Black Lives Matter movement. It, mm -hmm. You know, there was an important issue there. Mm -hmm. But that got taken over by an extreme and that important issue didn't get discussed. So it was, 
silly stuff brought up made to look important and if you didn't agree with the silly stuff then you were someone who supported black people being shot by the police yeah. and it's like no I don't support that but you know uh, you know like <sighs> And like I said, some of the silly reactions to it, like all lives matter. Yes, all lives do matter, but you know, mm-hmm. not everyone is being targeted by police. And then you know, you can, but like, let's look at statistics. Let, let's let's look at what happens. But then you're told statistics are racist because you know they, because statistics show that more murders happen in in you know urban communities, which means there's going to be people of color. So I'm like, you know, if, if you're at a point when statistics are racist, like what the hell? Yeah, I mean, data can't be racist. Yeah. Um, you know, it, if, that, if that's the point we've reached, we, there's nowhere to go from there. I think, you know, you're highlighting just what boils down to, I think, a lack of nuance. You know, it's, and I think it, it, part of the problem is just, is the short form nature of the engagements. You know, if you, you're getting a back and forth and, and tweet length or, you're reading the headline but not really going into the, the detail. I think that that's a real problem. And one of the things that we're hoping to do with Letter is actually go into the detail so that you can hold nuanced positions on difficult on difficult subject matters. And at the end of, let's say, it's a, each correspondent writes six letters at a 1,000 each, 1,000 words each. At the end of those 12,000 words, you've got an insight into – the subject that you can't get from a standalone article or a column or blog. And it's because you're getting people from opposing sides um, go deep. And uh, and it's just, there's a certain irony here in that as the more we build a letter, the more it, it just seems strange like that something like this doesn't really exist. Um, because it's, it's, it's how we've, it's how we've learned for centuries and it's kind of been lost in this post internet world. Yeah. Okay. That's, I was going to bring that up before cell phones and before you had phones that you could program phone numbers in. I still remember my phone number from when I was a kid. I remember all my friends' phone numbers. If one of my friends comes back and he's staying with his parents, you know, I can still call that number. I remember it off like no problem. I, yeah. I don't remember a single phone number ever since I started storing them in my cell phone, right? And, yeah. you know, I can do simple math. Most pe- I think everyone should be able to, but, you know, you, you go to a cash register today and if the thing gives them the wrong number, they can't figure it out. They can't do simple math. So maybe we've trained ourselves out of that now. And with something like Letter, we can train ourselves again to wait for a reply, to think something through, not just hit you know, search on Google or send on Twitter and wait for the likes or, you know, I own that person or, you know, I, you know, like I owned a lib today. Like who cares? Like, is that really yeah. what you wanted to accomplish? <laughs> yeah. What, what we want is people to highlight or at least to make a virtue out of good faith engagements. You know, to, if you're going to, share something on Twitter. And that is something that I should mention, you know, I've kind of been beating up on Facebook and Twitter, but I think they're awesome platforms if they're used in in the right way. And people have been sharing their letter exchanges on, on Twitter and Facebook. And that's leading to, it's almost like we've outsourced our comments section to those platforms. And I think that's really useful. You know, people are able to come and have their say and the writers, the authors of the, the conversation can actually view comments on, on, on the conversation that really I think is, is important but it shouldn't be the thing that dominates the, um, or, or kind of railroads the conversation whilst it's taking place I mean okay so like let's say something like letter and Twitter okay when Twitter first started out because I, I joined it when I first heard about it and it was a place for reviews basically right like I went to this restaurant it was great I went to this you know, re- vacation resort it was awesome that's why it was so short that's all it was really meant for. It wasn't meant for any kind of deep discussion. And mm-hmm. then it's, you know, then I think celebrities started using it saying, I'm here, come find me. And mm-hmm. then, then it devolved into the cesspool that we know what it is now. And, uh, you know, don't get me wrong. I've met a lot of great people on it, and I think mm-hmm. it has a benefit. But if you were to take something like Letter and you have those long-form conversations, and then, you know, I, that's where I see a lot of the ones that I've read and people put it out on Twitter. It's like, okay, I've had this conversation. 
Okay, mm-hmm. that's great. You advertise your conversation. People can then read it. They can comment some stuff there, but then if they are actually really interested, they can take the time to, you know, write the, you know, the person who wrote the letter or the person who received it, yeah. they can write it and make their own argument. And so, I, mean, I mean, I think if you can use letter and Twitter or letter and Facebook or, you know, like, you know, a combination of, you know, thereof, yeah. it, it would be a lot better. I think you're right. You know, I think it's, and we've started to see this kind of happening already where the conversations get initiated on, say, Twitter as an example, but then they migrate to Letter so that they can go into the detail and then they get shared back to Twitter at the end of the conversation for kind of to learn a bit about how people react to them. And I think that's that's a healthy balance. You know, I think the, you know, we, we can't replace the service that, Twitter provides. I think it's it's awesome. It it is a public square, but if you want to go into detail and you want to have a non-distracted, long-form conversation, then then Letter is the place to do that. And and you can circle back and share that to Twitter at the end of it. And I think I think the more we see these kinds of use cases evolving, it'll give us ideas about how to integrate uh, the other platforms more into what we're doing, so that we don't, you know, I, I'm being conscious of it. Not being, um, not being stating that we're replacing Facebook and Twitter. You know, I think ours is a lower uh, volume, higher value approach. So, you know, if you're on Twitter every day or Facebook every day, and you're you're scrolling through pictures or you commenting or liking friends stuff, that's that's what that platform was for. What we want is that when people spend time on Letter, it's probably going to be less frequent. But when they review that time and they compare it to time spent on the, the Instagrams, Twitters, and Facebooks of this world, they think that the letter is the highest quality time they spent on the internet, maybe up there with their their podcasts and, and things like that. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, I asked you guys this on Twitter, and I'm just going to bring it up again. And I, mean, I get your concerns and all that. Um but, you know, if you had, like, let's say you had an English teacher or a science teacher to, for middle school kids, right? So, and, they, you know, there's, okay, there's, you know, so many physicists or something on letter. And, like, could that one class write that person a letter to ask about a certain question or something like that to get kids, A, to learn how to write and mm-hmm. B, wait for an answer, not just get it right away, the the letter would have to come from another person who had a profile. Mm-hmm. I guess they could they could you know preface the letter by saying this is uh, this is a letter from our class. Yeah. But it, it, yeah, I mean, there's no reason you couldn't kind of hack a, a way to send a personal letter that was written from the class. But it would have to be via a individual profile of someone who'd signed up. But yeah, I mean, we're exploring all kinds of stuff now with universities and high schools, and I think there's a huge opportunity there to, to to get people to engage in this practice of having their ideas challenged. And in what I, I say ironically is a safe space. You know, let us safe in the sense that the crowd can't jump in in the middle of your conversation and derail it, but it's not safe in the sense that you're you're being shut off from ideas. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I think for kids to start to practice that at a young age is just incredibly invaluable. Um, and I think about my own family. I come from a got a big family. I've got three younger brothers, and just the the debates uh, that we would thrash out over the dinner table are just hugely beneficial and informative of my worldview. And if you don't have that sort of home environment, then having a space online that isn't Facebook or Twitter and all the inherent problems that they have where you can go to challenge and be challenged, I think is, is really important. Yeah. But I mean, obviously you don't want to devolve into letters about Pokemon or something like that. Well, I'm actually okay <laughs> with that. You know, I think, um, well, this is one of the, uh, the concerns that I have is that the, uh, I don't want the platform to be so intimidating to people that they feel as though they can't discuss anything. You know, we've had, We've had the dialectic, which is, you know, you've touched on it. There are people coming together to find truth through disagreement. But there's also the didactic, which is you know, usually some sort of domain expert educating someone who is curious about the subject matter. And I think that's really important as well. And then we have like the very traditional 
letter exchanges that, that kind of reflect what letters were uh, hundreds of years ago. It's just an exploration of what's happening in another person's life. And they, they are some of my favorite letters on the platform aren't actually uh, specifically a bad idea. They're, they're delving into the human experience. And I think that's hugely valuable. If you want to come on letter and write about, I mean, we have letter letters about, I think, Star Trek. And I mean, often there's some sort of philosophical thread through, them, which is cool. But yeah, I don't want people to feel as though they can't come on there. I mean, yeah, I hear what you're saying. We don't want it to divulge <laughs> into uh, diverge into like just you know, nonsense. Yeah. But yeah, feel free to come and write about Pokemon on letter. Uh, you probably won't have your letter featured on the featured letters page, but uh, you're welcome to do it. Yeah. Um, anyways, I don't want to take up too too much of your time and. Uh, if you want to let people know again how they can get into the competition, if you've got anything else you want to say, uh, sure. please feel free. Uh, where can people get a hold of you? So they can find the uh, they can find letter at letter dot wiki, and the conversation um, URL I think is conversations is impossible conversations dot info. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for listening. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed the chat.